Well, thank you very much. Uh, normally, when somebody gets up to give a talk like this, the first thing you say is, thank you very much for the kind introduction. But I actually have no idea what she just said. Um, so uh, just, just so you guys know, for what I just heard was, Robert Murphy. Man economy and state. So I, I hope that what she said was at least true. Thank you. I want to also, uh, to give a sort of preemptive apology, I haven't given the translators my remarks in English so that they can you know, read it for you guys, because I, I don't prepare beforehand. So for those of you who are, who are listening and you don't understand English, they may have difficulty, so it's not their fault, it's my fault. When I start talking about Austrian economics, I get very excited and I talk very quickly, so I'll try to keep it slow. The, the reason I don't prepare beforehand is because I like the remarks to be sort of a you know, spontaneous order. And also, my goal when I come to a conference like this is to give the best talk by an American. And so what I have to do is listen to Peter Klein first, and then I make sure I'm 10% better. Okay. So that's, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad Peter was here for that one. So let me uh, just, the, the, the thing a lot of you have been asking me during the breaks, you know, the obvious thing is, oh, is this your first time in Brazil? And I actually say this is my first time in the Southern Hemisphere. And so you say, oh, well, how do you find it? And I haven't been out very much. All I've really been here is at this conference. So let me uh, to sort of just let you guys know from the American perspective how the, the Mises Brazil conference, the, the similarities and, and dissimilarities between this conference and a typical American academic conference. So the first thing, of course, is the food here is phenomenal. We went to a, a steakhouse last night. And at this point, if I became a vegetarian, I would have no regrets. I, I've, I've, my life is complete. I've had enough more meat than any man deserves. Um, Guido Holtzman apparently is still there eating as we speak. Um, he, he may come in an ambulance for Hoppe's lecture later today. They have his photo up on the wall because they just could not believe how much uh, meat he ate last night. The, uh, another difference, a lot of you were asking in Sao Paulo, you say, oh, Dr. Murphy, how do you feel about our state-run airport? And you, you expected me to be real critical, but actually I loved the airport, Sao Paulo, because they, the security was very easy. I didn't have to take my shoes off. I didn't, I didn't have a $3 million machine scan me and you know, have them radio and say, is, is, you know, how does this guy look naked? Um, <laughs> and this part is actually true. Most of the stuff is jokes. but. Peter Klein went through and the metal detector went off. And they just said, go right ahead. They didn't even, they didn't even care. And if you think about it, it's because they're very rational. They, really, they looked at Peter Klein, they said, he's not a threat. Even on the plane, he could pull out a machete and the stewardess would be able to disarm him. So I mean, there's really, so I thought that was very rational as opposed to US airline security. What else do we have? Well, these things of course are a bit different. We don't typically use these at the uh, United States conferences. I feel like we're in the United Nations here with these things that we should be discussing what to do about Qaddafi, not about uh, <laughs> capital structure. Another difference is the, uh, the setup here. At a typical American conference, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have these, these nice chairs. This more looks like Oprah Winfrey uh, as opposed to, <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment. I hope you aspire to be. Uh, I would switch places with Oprah Winfrey if I could. Um, Another difference, the elevators here, we have to use, I have seen this in the United States, but it's not too often where you have to swipe your card to be able to go to various floors. And so this part's true, I was, I don't know why, I have a PhD, I couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> so I was in there, you know, I swiped it, I thought it worked, I pressed my room, but it didn't light up, so I thought, well, that's odd. But then the doors closed and it started moving, so I thought, oh, okay, it just, there's, a, there's a lag, it's like monetary policy, okay, this is fine. <laughs> But then it stopped at the wrong floor and opened, and so I realized someone on that floor, you know, had pressed the button. So I pretended like well, this is where I was going, and I got off, and there was some other convention going on, and the people were looking at me, and I just pretended, that, you know. And so I went back in again, couldn't get it to work, went back down to the lobby. So I was like a little child just riding the elevators. So I did it again, you know, the doors closed. They went up to the same floor because, of course, it's very busy. So I walked out. Hello again, it's me, and then. And I asked, the, there was an employee there, and I said, you know, stairs, and he, no, anglais, and he went to go get someone, so I ran away. And then finally, somehow, I just had to randomly wait until someone from my floor was leaving, and that's how I got up. Another thing, and this, this is true, this concerned me a bit, I wrote it down because I didn't want to, or I typed it in rather, 
I, don't want, I want to get the words exactly right. So on the, there's a similar one in this hotel, but on the, in the one in Sao Paulo, these were the exact words. So in English, on the elevator, the, you know, when you press the button, and it says, warning, before getting in, This is, well, and that's an, there's another difference. In the United States people usually wait for the punchline before they laugh. All right, so this says, warning, before getting in, make sure the lift is on this floor. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, if that's a common occurrence in Brazilian uh, elevators, but that's a, that's a good safety tip. You need to let foreigners know these things. Or now here, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to in, insult you guys or anything, this is, again, just the observation, I'm a scientist, I need to report these differences. So Americans, of course, they're very stereotypical, they are very elitist, and so when we think of Brazil, we think of jungles and gorillas, and you know, they, <laughs> and so I have to admit, it was a little bit funny when, at the opening of this conference, you said, yeah, the one speaker can't become here because he was attacked by a rattlesnake. <laughs> that, uh, I think you should next time just say, yeah, a supercomputer fell on his leg and uh, broke it, and so therefore, you know, there, he was working on robotics. And, and then I, I have one more observation, but it's a little bit avant-garde. I don't know, do you, do you want to hear it, or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, Elios, I'm a man of the people. They want to hear it. Okay, so it, it involves the, the toilet. Okay, now it's not, originally I was going to do research about which way the toilet's flushed, you know, that was my, but I found something far more interesting. It's not in the, uh, the restrooms by the, where, they, where they serve the, the food and where they're playing the Hayek Keynes video, it's, but it's in the one by the, uh, where the books are sold, so you should do some research afterward, the men, and you can maybe take a picture with your iPhone to show the women, because it's not fair that you, you miss out on this. In the urinals, so you guys know the word urinal, it's the, the male uh, toilet. So there's a sticker, and it says Automatico, okay? And it's showing a diagram of a guy standing like this, and it shows these things, it's automatical. And there's two interesting things. The first thing is the guy is naked. Have you seen this in the, in the thing? Again, it's, it's, in the, it's in the restroom by where the books are sold. If you want to go see this, you know, if you take nothing else away from my lecture, you should do this. Go look at that. So that's odd, and so I don't know like, if that's some kind of you know, crazy events you guys have, these Brazilian theaters where there's people you know, in intermission have to go naked into the bathroom. Because I would think you would at least wear some sort of footwear for sanitary reasons, but you know I don't I don't want to judge. And then the other odd thing is the guy has no arms in the picture. <laughs> and I have a hypothesis. I think what it is is they're trying to convey to you that look, for someone who doesn't have arms, use this particular urinal because automatical. You don't have to flush it. <laughs> you can just walk away. Well, that's all I have prepared. I'll uh, take my. Oh. I guess I'm supposed to talk about something about Austrian economics. All right, well, be, let me be serious for a minute at least. Uh, it is, it's very, um, I don't know, heartwarming, or uh, I get very enthusiastic coming to these events, that it's not just the United States. I mean, for, for real, in the United States now, there is a, people are very enthusiastic about Austrian economics, about liberty. They're uh, far more than they were before. People are getting really interested in it. I've seen a change. For example, I write articles for Mises.org, and five years ago, the sort of emails you would get about them, I would get from, from college students. They say, oh yeah, my professor loves Hayek, and so that's you know, why I read this, it's good stuff. But within the last few years, because of the financial crisis, the emails are coming from people who work at a hedge fund. You know, and, and so it's not that they're ideological, they just, they're coming to the Austrian school, they want to know what Austrian economists think about deflation, inflation, what do you think about QE2, because they know the the Keynesians on CNBC are crazy, right? That they know that those guys are just talking in circles and they're, you know, th it's not uh, real analysis. So, I, so that, that's very encouraging that I, we're definitely seeing some progress being made there. Now, I think you guys down here in Brazil are a little bit, you know, it's, it's behind in the sense that, you know, we, we started earlier in the United States and so we laid the foundation earlier, but I'm just trying to encourage you that you don't know when it's going to happen, but, but you know, for, for years, and I'm, I'm relatively new to the movement myself, but for years, the people at the Mises Institute in the United States were doing this. I mean, you talk to Jeff Tucker and people like that. In the beginning, what they would, it was just a few of them in a little room, and they would get in the, in the U.S. mail, you know, typewritten or handwritten, someone saying, I like this article by Murray Rothbard, can you send it to me? And they would go get the book and photocopy it. 
right, and then put 10 pieces of paper, staple it into an envelope, and send it to the guy, and they would think, you know, we're making a difference. Now one person in the world has this thing. Whereas now, you know, it's all online, and they get, I don't even know how many visits they get per day, but you see the point that they were doing that for literally decades, not knowing if it was going to matter, and then all of a sudden this financial crisis hits, and we had that huge infrastructure in place. And so when it all of a sudden conventional people on Wall Street and elsewhere in the financial sector, when they wanted to go somewhere, or just typical American households who weren't into reading economic treatises for fun, you know, not too many people do that, but they, when, when all of a sudden if your retirement portfolio, your 401k, or your, your savings drops by 40% in one year, which is what happened to a lot of American households, all of a sudden you're very concerned, what's going on? And you want someone to answer those questions and so it was fortunate that the Mises Institute had Human Action Online, had Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money and all these other things just waiting there for when people wanted it, okay? And so it, it, would have been, it wouldn't have been fast enough. If we, if we had been waiting for that opportunity and then tried to get a bunch of donations and tried to get everything set up, we would have missed the window, right? So the point is it had to all be sitting there waiting when all of a sudden a rush of people needed to know the answers, and there it was for them. So I, I just would, again, encourage you guys, you're, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, how can I put it? Right now you have some idea of the difference you're making, but ex post, you won't even, you, you, the things you're gonna have influenced, you won't even realize until after it happens. And they say, well, it's a good thing we were doing this. So again, I would just encourage you, and I, it, there, there are two trends going on at the same time. That in the United States, the, the, the federal government, of course, is getting more and more powerful. You know, Barack Obama is worse in every respect than George Bush was. But since he's a liberal, supposedly a liberal Democrat, you know, he sort of neutered a lot of the, the opposition. The people who thought George Bush was a tyrant now are overlooking those same things because it's Barack Obama, and they were so enthusiastic about it. And the same thing with George Bush. There were a lot of right-wing free market conservatives who didn't object strongly when he nationalized the banks, whereas if that had been a Democrat who had done those things, they would have been calling him a socialist, right? So it's... There's a lot that's wrong with the American political system, but what I'm telling you is at least the American public, a growing fraction of them are learning these ideas and becoming interested in it. And so it's, it's sort of like a race, I guess, to see which, which uh, force over, overtakes the other one. But certainly the things we're doing are, are paying off, so I would encourage you to, to continue with your efforts down here. Okay, so I'm supposed to be talking about Austrian and Keynesian business cycle theory and how it relates to the un unemployment data or employment data. One thing I think it's important to stress at the, at the beginning, and, and I think Dr. Hoppe is going to talk about business cycle theory more directly in the next talk, so I won't, I won't focus on that. But I want to point one thing out, that when you're addressing a, a Keynesian economist or you're having a debate, there's a, they, they don't even know how to classify the Austrian theory. And just to give you the example, when Paul Krugman, the one time he publicly acknowledged me, he, he linked to an article that I wrote for the Mises Institute, and he said, okay, yes, the, it was on business cycle theory. And he said, yes, this is theoretically possible, but what evidence do these Austrians have that this is what's going on in modern market economies when there's you know, a boom-bust cycle? And, and then Krugman gave what he thought were a lot of empirical reasons to reject the Austrian explanation. So just for those of you who are completely new to this, so the Austrians, they explain the conventional boom-bust cycle in market economies. They say it's that uh, in modern times, the central bank will, will lower interest rates by pumping in more fiat money, expanding credit and money and credit, and so that makes interest rates go below their market level, right? So, they, so the interest rate is no longer serving its proper function of communicating how much savings are available to the economy, right? Because the interest rate is a price that communicates information, and so if it's the wrong number, that messes things up. And so the Austrians say what, what it does is it sets in motion an unsustainable boom, and then at some point the boom collapses, usually because the central bank becomes more cautious and they stop inflating so much and the interest rates rise, and then the businessmen realize they made a mistake.